Hey everyone, in this lesson we're going to talk about the protozoal disease known as African trypanosomiasis. So to begin, what is African trypanosomiasis? Well, African trypanosomiasis is a disease caused by an infection with a parasitic protozoa from the genus Trypanosoma. And here's an image of those Trypanosoma parasitic protozoa. African trypanosomiasis is also known as African sleeping sickness, and we'll talk about why that is later on in the lesson. The Trypanosoma protozoa that causes African trypanosomiasis is transmitted by the tsetse flies of the genus Glossina, and here's an image of a tsetse fly. Now it is estimated that about 100,000 deaths occur each year due to African trypanosomiasis, and the disease African trypanosomiasis is distributed in the sub-Saharan African region. Here's a map of the area where African trypanosomiasis occurs. And interestingly, this is also the distribution of the tsetse fly. So the tsetse fly, um, its natural distribution is in the same area and it also transmits the disease African trypanosomiasis in this area. So what are some of the trypanosoma species that cause African trypanosomiasis? Well, one of the species that causes African trypanosomiasis is Trypanosoma brutti rhodesiens. And Trypanosoma bruti rhodesiens causes an acute illness, and it is more located in East uh, Africa, so in the Eastern uh, Sub-Saharan African region. The second species that causes African trypanosomiasis is Trypanosoma bruti gambiens. And this species causes a more chronic condition, so as opposed to the Brutti rhodesiens, which uh, causes an acute and rapid illness, Brutti gambiens causes a more chronic and slowly um, progressing illness. Um, and an example of this is the meningoencephalitic stage. It takes about 250 days to occur, and we'll talk a bit more about these stages of the illness a little later. The Trypanosoma Brutti gambian species occurs in the west and central part of the sub-Saharan African region, so as opposed to the Brutti rhodesiens, which occurs in the east African region. Now there are other species of trypanosoma protozoa that cause African trypanosomiasis as well. Some of them include trypanosoma Brutti Brutti, Brutti Luisi, Brutti Congolens, and Brutti Evansi. So these also can cause uh, African trypanosomiasis, but the major two in the, are the most important um, species that cause African trypanosomiasis is the Trypanosoma brutti rhodesiens and Trypanosoma brutti gambiens. So we're going to talk about those two more specifically in this lesson. Now here's a life cycle of the Trypanosoma species that causes African trypanosomiasis. Now we mentioned that these Trypanosoma species are carried within this CT fly. Now the CT fly um, as we mentioned before, is located within the sub-Saharan African region, and it is commonly found in warm and shaded areas, and the tsetse fly lives for about one to six months. When a tsetse fly encounters a person, that tsetse fly can take a blood meal or bite that person, and when they bite the person, they actually inject metacyclic trypomastigotes. Once these metacyclic trypomastigotes are inside the person, they can transform into bloodstream trypomastigotes. And then they can be carried to other sites in the body. So these uh, trypomastigotes can then enter into um, other sites such as the lymphatic system, into the lymph, uh, and they can also even enter into spinal fluid. Once they are within these different areas of the body, the trypomastigotes can continually multiply by binary fission. And they can start causing a lot of the symptoms we'll discuss in the next couple of slides. Now, when trypomastigotes are inside the blood, if a tsetse fly encounters the person that is infected, the actual tsetse fly can actually take a blood meal and actually itself become infected um, with the bloodstream trypomastigotes. So the bloodstream trypomastigotes can be ingested by the tsetse fly from an infected person, and then the tsetse fly can be um, a carrier of these trypomastigotes that can infect other individuals later. 
So once the TT fly ingests bloodstream trypanosomiasis from an infected individual, these bloodstream trypanosomiasis inside the TT fly can then transform into procyclic trypanosomiasis within the TT fly's midgut. And then these uh, procyclic trypanosomiasis can multiply again by binary fission. The procyclic trypanosomiasis eventually leave the midgut of the TT fly and then transform into epimastigotes. The epimastigotes can then enter into the salivary gland of the TT fly and multiply there. And then inside the, the salivary gland, they can then transform into the metacyclic trypanosomiasis. And those metacyclic trypanosomiasis can then infect another person when that TT fly bites someone else. So that is the entire cycle of the trypanosoma species that causes African trypanosomiasis. So if an individual is infected with a trypanosoma species, that individual does have some innate immunity through the protein apolipoprotein L1. And apolipoprotein L1 is in fact trypanolytic. So what happens is the trypanosoma species can engulf the apolipoprotein L1 through an endosome, but the apolipoprotein L1 actually causes a destruction of the trypanosoma. And with humoral immunity, there is a major variant surface glycoprotein or VSG on the trypanosoma organism. But what is interesting and what is important for the pathogenesis of uh, trypanosomiasis is that the trypanosoma can actually periodically switch their VSG or their variant surface glycoprotein. So they can make changes to that protein. So when the body of an infected individual makes antibodies to a specific variant surface glycoprotein, that trypanosoma can change or switch their VSG so that those antibodies are no longer effective. So they can continually avoid or attempt to avoid the um, infected person's humoral immunity response. And we call this antigenic variation. And this leads to nonspecific activation of humoral immunity. So as the body continually attempts to target that variant surface glycoprotein, the trypanosoma can switch the variant surface glycoprotein and evade the infected person's humoral immunity response. Now, if an individual is infected with a trypanosoma, a species that causes African trypanosomiasis, what are some of the symptoms? Well, the symptoms are actually divided into two stages, stage one, early infection, and stage two, late infection. So in an early infection, there are specific symptoms that occur. One of them that is most important is where the CT fly actually bit into the person, and it can actually cause what is called a trypanosomal chancre. And here is a trypanosomal chancre. This is typically in most cases, the first sign that can um, be detected. It usually occurs one week after a bite from the TT fly. It's well circumscribed. It's described as rubbery, and it's considered painful, and it is indurated. Now, there's also a rash that can occur as well, a trypanosomal rash, and the rash typically occurs uh, within six to eight weeks after the initial infection. It is transient urticarial and it's macular. And the lymphatic system um, can be involved as well in the early stages of infection. So the trypanosoma travel to regional lymphatics. So once they are uh, taken up into the body, they can travel into the lymphatic system in regional uh, areas and it can cause lymph lymphadenitis. So an inflammation of the lymph nodes. With the trypanosoma brutsi gambiens, the lymph nodes in the posterior cervical area, the posterior cervical lymph nodes are the ones that are typically affected. And they uh, lead to a painless and enlarged uh, posterior cervical lymph nodes. And this is called winter bottom sign. So here's an image of a winter bottom sign. You can see here, this individual has these enlarged lymph nodes in certain areas 
along their back and in their neck. Now the other species, Trypanosoma brutti rhodesiens, has a different uh, distribution with regards to the lymphatic system. It typically has less lymphadenopathy, so it doesn't affect the lymph nodes as much as Trypanosoma brutti gambiens. But when it does, it affects the submandibular axillary and inguinal lymph nodes the most, as opposed to Brutti gambians, which actually causes uh, the posterior cervical lymph nodes to be affected. So now that we know what happens in the early stages of African trypanosomiasis infection, what happens in the later stages? Well, in stage two, or the late infection of African trypanosomiasis, this is considered stage two or late infection once the central nervous system is involved. And once the central nervous system is involved, if left untreated, the mortality rate is 100%. The involvement of the CNS can be determined if there is an elevated white blood cell count within the cerebral spinal fluid. And it usually is about at least five cells or five white blood cells per microliter. With an infection of Trypanosoma brutti gambians, it, for stage two infection, for uh, during an earlier um, exposure, it can lead to progressive diffuse meningoencephalitis. It can lead to meningeal inflammatory infiltrates, and it can lead to widespread focal white matter demyelination. And with all of those effects, some of the symptoms involved due to an infection with Trypanosoma brutti gambians include headaches, difficulty concentrating, completing complex tasks, personality changes, psychosis, and tremors and ataxia. Other symptoms of a tr infection with Trypanosoma brutti gambians include alterations in circadian rhythm leading to daytime somnolence or excessive daytime sleepiness. And now this is very important as this is the reason why African trypanosomiasis is also referred to as African sleeping sickness because of the alterations in circadian rhythm. And if left untreated, uh, trypanosoma brutti gambians infections eventually lead to a comatose state in patients. Now, an infection with trypanosoma brutti rhodesiens uh, has similar symptoms to Trypanosoma brutti gambians, but has a more rapid onset, and it typically can take only weeks. So Trypanosoma brutti rhodesiens infection is acute and severe and febrile, and it can also have symptoms of myocarditis and pericarditis. So how do we actually diagnose African trypanosomiasis? And once we diagnose, how do we actually treat it? Well, diagnosis of African trypanosomiasis can be accomplished by a blood smear to see if we actually can see the trypanosoma protozoa. And a blood smear for diagnosing African trypanosomiasis is more important with trypanosoma brutti rhodesiens because we can actually see them actually in the bloodstream or in the blood. And it can be positive in earlier stages as trypanosoma brutti rhodesiens um, can rapidly um, infect and rapidly proliferate in a patient. And to detect on a blood smear, typically we need to see about at, at least 5,000 um, protozoa per ml of blood. Now with tissue aspirate, uh, this can be important as if the uh, trypanosoma species infects the lymph nodes, we can actually take an aspirate of the lymph node and look at it under a microscope and then we might be able to see the trypanosoma species that way. And this is important with trypanosoma brutti gambians as these, uh, the species typically involves the lymph nodes. So a tissue aspirate can be important for diagnosing patients with an infection with trypanosoma brutti gambians. As well, cerebral spinal fluid, um, so a spinal tap is important to see if we can detect any uh, trypanosoma within the spinal fluid or if we can see any white blood cells. So we can, we may be able to see pleocytosis within the cerebral spinal fluid. Serology is also important to detect to see if we can find any antibodies to any of these trypanosoma species. 
And PCR is also a method to diagnose patients with infections. One of the most important things before we start treatment is to check the patient's cerebral spinal fluid. That's one of the first things we want to do because that will determine if it's an early stage or stage one inf infection or if it's later stage or stage two infection. And that's important because depending on the stage, if it's early or late, that will change what treatment we use. So if the patient has been found to be infected with trypanosoma brutzi gambiens, and it's been determined that it's an early infection, then we can use pentamidine. And if we don't use pentamidine, we could use suramin. And if it's been found that it is a late infection of trypanosoma brutzi gambiens, we would have to use eflornithine, plus or minus nifertamox. So the reason that we change the uh, medication. The reason that we use eflornithine as opposed to pentamidine is because pentamidine does not cross the blood-brain barrier well. Eflornithine does. So in order to uh, treat a CNS-involved infection of trypanosomiasis, we'd have to use something that can cross the blood-brain barrier. So eflornithine would be the one we'd use. Now, if it was found that the patient was infected with trypanosoma brutzi rhodesiens, and it was determined that it was an early infection, that there was no CNS involvement, we could use suramin as the treatment. But if it was found to be a late infection, CNS was involved, and it was a uh, trypanosoma brutzi rhodesiens infection, we'd have to use malarsoprol. And, um, and you might be wondering, okay, why, don't, why can't we use eflornithine in these cases? Well, it appears that eflornithine has no effect on treating uh, trypanosoma brutzi rhodesiens, so we have to use malarsoprol. So that's the reason why it's important to also figure out what species we're dealing with as well. And malarsoprol um, can be, uh, 10 daily injections can be used to treat and that's been shown to be effective. Anyways guys, that was a lesson on African trypanosomiasis. I hope you found this video helpful. If you did, please like and subscribe for more videos like this one. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you next time.